And the, and the work on, on the Angola farm is done by the prisoners. Is or it's done by the prisoners. And, and, the, and But you're saying that individuals may profit from that? Oh, definitely they profit from it. In fact, some years ago it was doing the latter 80s and early 90s, there was an embargo against South Africa because of the apartheid practices. Yes. I personally had in my hand labels from cans, little gallon cans of food, packed right there in Angola, and it states it was destined for South Africa. And I managed to send some of this information out, and suddenly the practice was covered then, because at first it was open. I was a prisoner at that time. And there was never any follow-up through news media or investigative agency, unless there's something ongoing from that time up until now, which is highly improbable. That's just one of the instances. And people say, well, here's so much about what. I'm not going to have prisoners enjoying my taxpayers' money. They're up there watching television, doing this, that, or the other. There are televisions in Angola and other prisons, too. But at the same time, people don't realize that Angola is self-sufficient economically. The taxpayers' money is not used to sustain prisoners. These, there are excuses given to collect taxes, and the state is supposed to appropriate funds to supervise prisons or to run the prisons or whatever. But at the same time, Angola, even with the sugarcane industry, when they had the sugarcane, there were contracts given with the cotton. There was a company called LB Coco across the river from Angola that had a contract to get the cotton from the slave labor. At one time, the prisoners were working in the fields for two cents an hour. Then there was a raise to four cents an hour, but there was a department policy that prohibited prisoners from spending 50 percent of the money, the rationale being that when released, prisoners would have, wouldn't have to commit crimes if they could save enough money while in prison to come out and get themselves situated because many people have been involved in that revolving door process because they come out and they don't have anywhere to live or whatever, and they'll throw a brick. That is a way of saying that they'll do something in desperation and wind up back in prison. But how long would one have to be in prison to earn any meaningful amount at, of at money an at hour. that rate? Yeah. But again, where are the funds deposited? I've questioned this while up there, and there was a company called Sarah, which is a medical facility, that would come in and draw blood from the prisoners. The prisoners called it bleeding, but it was the plasma program. And twice a week, prisoners would be permitted to bleed. And for each bleeding, at one time, they would get $6.25. I personally had in my hand, during the latter 1970s, documentation to substantiate that there was an agreement between Sarah and the Louisiana Department of Corrections to pay a dollar, for Sarah to pay a dollar and 25 cent to the state for each prisoner that bled. And there are thousands of prisoners that bled. Yeah. But the trick was Angola was getting a dollar 25 cent from Sarah, but they would also take out a dollar and 25 cent from each inmate's account for the same bleeding. But there was no law to justify it. But again, this just got blown away in the wind, too, because it's, it's too big. Now, you're talking about your experience in some years past. Uh, is that sort of thing still continuing? I have been out of prison since September the 8th of 1997. And since then, I've maintained communication with prisoners in both state and federal institutions. I correspond. I've received phone calls from them, too. And the impression I have is that it's business as usual, but a bit more sophisticated. And the uh, and the uh, the news people uh, have not taken any interest in uh, in what could be a you know a, a major scandal. The conventional news media were notified before something broke during the latter eighties. In fact, from. 80, excuse me, from 89 to 93, the Louisiana Department of Corrections was under a federal court order because of abuses that started with a complaint filed at Angola. I had documented 62 instances of improprieties on the part of medical, administrative, and security personnel, even showing deaths that they claim were 
either accidental deaths or suicide that weren't, in fact, accidental deaths or suicide. And I know this is a very serious accusation, but all the evidence that I presented showed this. And warden, former warden Ross Maggio and a guy named Russell Cook were appointed to come in and investigate at that time relative to these allegations. And what happened is when warden, former warden Ross Maggio called a guy named Ed Lenny and me one day to interview us relative to these complaints, then I explained that at the hospital there were documents being forged as a result of a guy, I'm trying to think of his name, I think it was I'll think of his name before I leave you, Harry. But anyway, this prisoner was not supposed to have access to any bedding or belts or anything with which he might be able to hang himself because he had suicidal tendencies. When the man hanged himself, immediately they called in personnel, medical personnel at Angola, and they began to dis destroy documents and falsify. And I personally heard one of the guards say, well, look, put somebody's name, which was one of the Asian medical employees, they said, because they just signed it and it seemed like, you know, they signed it, but that would make it official for them to have given whatever the inmate had to hang him. So it was a bed sheet. This is, oh, boy, I thought of his name. It was a bed sheet that he used, but he wasn't supposed to have access to it. That's mm -hmm. one of the many instances. And I personally told a prisoner's visitor something that I observed when the prisoner was handcuffed and shackled to the bed and beaten unmercifully. The prisoner's name was Calvin Clark, and I told this to his mother and his niece. And shortly after, then assistant, whatever his capacity was, it was Richard Peabody came in, and the officer... Ray Norman said that the warden wanted to see me. He was an assistant warden. Peabody was. And I said, yes. He said, oh, did you tell this man's family anything? I said, yes, I did. He said, well, since you opened your big mouth, let me see some proof of this. I said, well, I have documentation showing that abuse and a number of others, and it's listed right here. I said, now, if you want anything beyond this material, <clears throat> excuse me, I can let my lawyer know, and then you can consult the lawyer because there's information outside to substantiate all these claims. And one of the prisoners told me shortly thereafter that when he left the hospital area, he said, that SOB is crazy, referring to me. Well, uh, other than maybe calling you names, does the fact that you're documenting these abuses put you in some serious jeopardy? I, yes, it did, but it's not like I felt myself to be a hero. As a matter of fact, before this scandal hit the public, when the system was put under federal court order, yeah. A lawyer named David Utter asked me, are you ready to go all the way with this? Because you know these guys are going to play hardball. And my response was, if I allow the fear of what could happen to prevent me from doing what I know would be the right thing to do, then I wouldn't deserve the air that I breathe. I'm ready to go as far as necessary, regardless of how far that might be. And you have been doing that. I have to. I, now, have to. I know that you have a particular interest in, uh, in three uh, uh, of the Angola prisoners who were there with, uh, with on life, I don't know whether whether it was life sentences or for execution, uh, that uh, uh, that you were, have particularly been involved with trying to get uh, get either the rulings reversed or and and I understand one of them has most recently been released. Tell us about that.